an assistant United States attorney said, what's wrong with this stuff? I refuse to take, or I decline to take this case to a federal grand jury. And he almost made a new wall in the federal building that day. Is Fortunately, the case did get prosecuted because a very nice gentleman from the Brooklyn U.S. Attorney's Office was transferred, and he took the ball and ran with it. In four and a half days, the jury came back in 50 minutes, Gilly on all counts, and Mr. Gilman is doing 15 years in the federal Stony Lonesome at Terminal Island, where he belongs. A uh, senator? A senator. Senator well, McConnell, I believe. Senator who? McConnell. Well, you know, he's obviously not a pornography investigator. He, he may be right. I think I'm right. Uh, you know, if I went down to Broward County or Miami today, knowing all the stores and all the people involved, uh, uh, if I sent an undercover cop in, into any one of those stores, I can almost guarantee you I couldn't get it today. I'd have to order it shipped in through the port of New York or some other port from Denmark or uh, uh, the Netherlands. Now, I understand it was available at the International Consumers Electronic Show porno section in Las Vegas. I don't know that's true. The LAPD says it's true. You might ask them, they're going to be here. But I can't find it now. The only kind of porno I get is the pedophile stuff, the, the cottage variety homegrown stuff, not the slick magazine material that we used to get before the federal government finally, in 1968, passed the Child Exploitation Act, which really, really did the job. And then they updated it in 84 and made it even better. Uh, people are mad about kiddie porn. That's great. But not enough of us are upset about this menace. And the reason for that is, they say, consenting adults, First Amendment, and all that stuff. All those, all those arguments have been legally knocked down years ago, but nobody seems to want to pay attention. Mr. Shower knows all about that. Excellent book. Thank you. I use it all the time. Yeah. Professor Shower, do you have a question, Mr. Kelly? Yes, but I think on a somewhat <coughs> different subject at the moment. Uh, can we go back, uh, Mr. Kelly, uh, to your an estimate uh, of the size of the industry that would be involved in materials that would be legally obscene under current law? Probably less than half, I'm guessing. An awful lot of porno is not against the law. Uh, certainly an awful lot of it is. I saw some material today, this morning before I spoke, which uh, obviously shocked the conscience of the person who showed it to me. But if I were a United States attorney in Miami, I would not take it to a grand jury for a prosecution under the ITOM statute. Because in my opinion, it is borderline softcore stuff. It's nasty stuff, but it's not the kind of, when, when we go into court, we go in with what we consider the roughest that are rough. And sometimes we, we miss on that, depending upon how good we are at selecting jurors, which is an art, as you well know. And Finally, if we can... When did this get to be a problem? It got to be a problem the same year Hoover died. Now, nobody ever says that, but that's true. That's when Deep Throat hit the market. If he'd still been around, uh, I can guarantee you there, there'd been FBI agents out uh, uh, making, uh, making more cases because he was real strong against obscenity. Uh, but that's the way it goes down. Uh, those are the facts of life, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for the compliment before. You deserve it. Could you please briefly outline your background in organized crime, specifically La Costa Nostra? Well, I got uh, put into the program and uh, into La Costa Nostra in 19, late 1947 or early 48. Uh, that's almost 40 years. Uh, I uh, became a capo in 1952 and became, uh, got transferred to the Chicago family in 1960 or 61. Uh, then I got back to the Los Angeles family as acting boss in 1975. And, and there you remained until uh, in Los Angeles? Until I got into the program, yes. Right. Uh, are you the author of The Last Mafioso? Well, I, it was my book. Mm -hmm. uh, Ava Damaris wrote it. Uh, although I have never re read it. Okay. Uh, have you testified in any United States court as an expert witness on organized crime? Yes, I have. Okay. 
Uh, reflecting on your past uh, involvement in organized crime, uh, are you familiar with uh, organized crime's involvement in the pornographic industry? Uh, some, yes. Uh, could you describe uh, the nature, the type of involvement that organized crime would have in the pornographic industry when you were active in organized crime? Well, it's very, very big. Just made just millions of dollars. Okay. How many crime families are there? Oh, I don't know. I think there's 26, 27, somewhere in that area. Okay. Are all of them involved in uh, pornography, or do you know how many? I would say uh, the majority. The majority. Of Some them. way or another. Uh, have you ever heard of the name D.B.? Yes, I have. Okay. <laughs> yeah, could you turn that light off, please? Thank you. Okay, this first slide is of Norman Arno. I will not go into the actual explanations. Uh, retired FBI agent uh, Bill Kelly described all these individuals in detail. The second individual is Charles, Noel Charles Bloom. This is Robert D. Bernardo, also known as D.B. This is Donald David Epstein. This is Jacob Gresser, known as Jack Gresser. <coughs> this is Kenneth Francis Guarino. This is Joel, uh, correction, Martin Joel Hodes, also known as Marty. This is Harry Virgil Money. This is Theodore Rothstein, also known as Teddy Roth. And this final individual is uh, Reuben Sturman. I believe we're going to take a break now unless any commissioners has a question. For the type of publications he was instrumental in printing and distributing. And he said, quote, I have the best lawyers that money can buy. In Hollywood, I have Stanley Fleshman. In Houston, Texas, I have Percy Foreman. In Chicago, I have the law firm of Bieber and Brodkin. And in Washington, D.C., I have Abe Fortas, who can fix anything no matter what administration is in power. Unquote. It's amazing, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the commission, that I testified to this in Houston, Texas. It took about 45 minutes to testify to a better than a four-hour interview in which my partner, Richard K. Finney, and I had conducted with Mr. Hamling in his home in Palm Springs. At the time that I testified to this interview, Abe Fortas had already been elevated as a justice to the U.S. Supreme Court. When the Senate committee was having hearings on elevating Abe Fortas to the chief justice position, the transcript of my testimony was obtained. And amazingly enough, all the portions referring to Abe Fortas was not in the United States District Court's transcript in Houston, Texas, pertaining to that testimony. In the interview of Hamling, he claimed to be a religious individual, that he didn't believe any of the material he was publishing and distributing was harmful to anyone. When Hamling was asked why he didn't display his publications on the coffee table in his home so that his visitors could peruse it, Hamling replied that he couldn't do that because he had a 14-year-old daughter in his home. Hamling Chicago's attorneys handled the incorporating of the Reed Enterprises when another name was needed to have a full slate of officers for the corporation. 
the attorneys had one of their clients listed as the vice president. His name was Bart Brown. When the officers of the corporation were subpoenaed before the federal grand jury in Houston, Texas in 1964, Bart Brown appeared accompanied by his attorney, Morris Schenker, who was then of St. Louis, Missouri. Further identifying information obtained by the federal grand jury in Houston at that time pertaining to the background of Bart Brown was to the effect that Bart Brown was listed in the intelligence files in Chicago, Illinois as being a top jewel thief. The same Bart Brown was later used by Marvin Miller of Covina, California, along with Eli Lubin of Los Angeles to attempt to collect a debt which Marvin Miller claimed that Reuben Sturman of Cleveland, Ohio owed him. Eli Lubin was known in the Southern California area as having been an associate of Meyer Mickey Cohen. Marvin Miller also attempted through Bart Brown and Eli Lubin to collect an alleged debt owed to Miller by Mike Thevis, doing business as Peachtree News Company in Atlanta, and whether or not Mike Thevis owed a debt to Marvin Miller. By way of identification of some of the characters involved, the noted that Cohen always claimed he was, quote, clean as the driven snow, unquote even though he was known to be an associate of Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, who was identified coming from the New York mob and having a partner named Meyer Lansky, closely with Johnny Rosselli from the Chicago mob. Mr. Rosselli is deceased now. In view of Cohen's statements, the press tabbed Mickey Cohen and his associates as Snow White and the <coughs> Seven Dwarfs. Eli Lubin was one of those. In 1968, Marvin Miller, doing business in Covina, California, as, quote, Collectors Publication, Inc., unquote, an Arizona corporation, was charged in an F FBI investigation before the federal grand jury at Los Angeles with having violated the federal law pertaining to the interstate shipments of paperback books and some of the paperback books from the pornographic library maintained at the University of Indiana. However, Maurice, I was there at the request of one of the district attorney's investigators, and I noted that an attempt was being made by those producing these photographs to place these in, quote, a literary or a scientific, unquote, category. This will prevent pregnancy, unquote. <coughs> by the way, the individual that was typing these little phrases under this various photographs in the plant, was a high school graduate. But the film and paperback book had been made with the cooperation of a medical doctor by pointing out that if this was really true, and again running the film for the jury, why would the male and the female participants have such dirty feet? Apparently, the film having been made secretly in a warehouse, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, reviewing the conviction of Marvin Miller, pointed out that the magazine in question was nothing more than, quote, a series of photographs depicting a vagina surrounded by a woman. The only social redeeming feature of this publication was that the pages were numbered in numerical order. Unquote. As a result of this decision, Miller then contracted to have films and paperback books made and distributed through a New York firm who had contacted Miller during the course of the trial, wanting to buy his plant in the event he was convicted and had to go to prison. Miller identified seen matter cases being worked by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Through this work, I knew that the film processing plant had been set up by the Joe Colombo family in New York with the purpose of putting a week 
and all was to be the hardcore 400-foot reels of film, some of the films having been duplicated from other films which they had picked up around the country. Some of the films were to be made in Greenwich Village in New York. This also confirmed a prior investigation of an individual, Walter Lee Eastman, who made monthly trips from Tucson, Arizona to Los Angeles, California to purchase hardcore films that were being sold along Main Street in Los Angeles to the FBI in Los Angeles that he had been threatened telephonically by a lieutenant of the Chicago Police Department. Miller claimed he had sent the film, quote, adults, unquote. This was the film in the 1968 case in Los Angeles for display in Chicago, and there was a bill of $40,000 owed to Miller. In going to Chicago, Miller he said, said he was met by the lieutenant from the Chicago 13th Precinct and his partner who worked in Mayor Daly's outer office, his films through their corporation. When taking Miller to dinner, the lieutenant introduced Miller to an individual in the restaurant with whom he returned to California from his Chicago trip. He made another demand to the Chicago and break up the legs, unquote, of Marvin Miller. This was the alleged federal violation, which Miller refused to do, believing it would be a suitable vehicle for federal prosecution. Miller then learned that Hamling had contracted with Milton Lewis at a cost of $1.85. Sale price of this publication when it went on the stand was $12.50. As soon as the indictments went down in Dallas and San Diego in the United States District Courts for violation of the federal law, it was jumped to $25 a copy. It is now a collector's item. It was a reflection on the amount of money that was taken from their group was to use only their own materials and in the event of any legal problems to furnish legal assistance and financial backing to their members. Also, being a member of this group required that you refuse to cooperate with law enforcement investigators. One of the legitimate distributors from the Los Angeles area related to me at the end of this convention of the, quote, Presidential Commission on Obscenity and Pornography, which existed during 1968 to 1970, and therefore, a member of the commission was invited to their Bahamas meeting in April of 1970, and the commission was to report its findings in July of 1970. When it was learned at trial, during the executions of the search warrants at the Cangiano's film processing plant on Staten Island in 1968, I think they were opening it, who originated from Cleveland, Ohio, and denies having had any connections with Reuben Sturman prior to leaving Cleveland. Noel Charles Bloom had been one of the Miami pornography sting, also a co-defendant with Joe Zernick and Steve Acid, also known as Steve Martin, who are employees of Reuben Sturman of Cleveland, Ohio. Having testified the question by defense attorneys as to when I first observed what I consider to be obscene or pornographic matters. I really enjoy receiving that question because the first night that I reported for work in the Los Angeles FBI office was August 17, 1940. Evidence seized from one of the 17 German spies in the Duquesne case which was tried later in New York in 1941, was being processed at the office that night to be held for trial purposes. This individual, the German spy, had transported a trunk load of photographs from New York to Los Angeles, and the photographs were of himself, his wife, and their maid. Let me explain that in 1940, 
The Germans who wanted to return to the fatherland had to come to the west coast, get on a Japanese boat to Japan, then to the Siberian Railroad, and back into Germany that way. That's why we had an influx of Germans leaving the United States at that time, coming to the west coast. Also at this time in 1940, Commander Atura Tashibana of the Imperial Japanese Navy with five of his staff members used what we call, quote, stag type films, unquote, to lure the Japanese born boys in the fishing fleets to meetings, try to give them a commission in the Imperial Japanese Navy, and thereby know the soundings of our harbors, the going and coming of our ships. I point this out briefly to show the lure of the films, even at that time, to bring people in where if they could find a weakness in their background, fine. If they wanted to see it, they were in, and then they were into the organization that they wanted. In the films that we see is from Tashibana. These films were made in Spain, Italy, France, Hong Kong, and Manila. Practically all the films degraded religion of any type. Some depicted priests and nuns involved in sexual intercourses in wheelbarrows in the fields. As an investigator, you are required to be able to identify the evidence that you seize. To maintain a log of where, how, and who was involved in the seizure and to maintain, quote, a chain of evidence, unquote. In order to get into court with this, you must be able to know where this material has been the entire time from the time you seized it. Therefore, defense attorneys attempt to show the court and jury that the investigators really didn't need to run the films in their entirety and probably gained a great amount of joy and pleasure from reviewing this evidence, which should really be labeled as garbage. Therefore, from my experience in the FBI, I have viewed many thousands of feet of film, reviewed photographs and magazines, all in an official capacity. Following my voluntary retirement from the FBI in April of 1972, I became a faculty member at California Lutheran College. Through my past associations with Father Morton A. Hill, previously mentioned in connection with Marvin Miller. From time to time, I am contacted by individuals wanting to get started in identifying individuals in the field of pornography. Not only law enforcement individuals, but investigative reporters as well. My stock answer to them is this. Getting into this field is much like putting both your hands into a bucket of worms. Really, the wriggling continues. They survive no matter how you cut them up, and it goes on and on. From the years that I personally have spent in this field and endeavor to eliminate this sickness, this disease, I have learned that unless you have a dedicated prosecutor that does not fall for the ACLU line that says such filth is protected by the First Amendment, that you try a case against my client and I'll tie you and your staff up and run you over your budget, you will lose your prosecutive status as not losing any cases, and so these charges go on and on against the prosecutor. The prosecutor today does not have to stand alone, but can obtain research that is up to the minute through the National Obscenity Law Center here in New York with Paul McGady. You can have an experienced trial lawyer with you by your side from Bruce Taylor from the Citizens for Decency Through Law in Phoenix. You can have all of their research behind them more than likely covered by Los Angeles and New York, where alert and favorable prosecutors to getting the job done could be installed. In view of the fact the United States attorneys are not elected but are appointed, perhaps the backgrounds of the individual pushing their appointments should also be examined. And the Lesbian Rights Committee of the National Organization for Women, representatives of this group are standing beside me right now. I'm also speaking for many well-known feminist writers, including Kathleen Barry, Robin Morgan, Diana Russell, Cher Haidt, Phyllis Chesler, and Gloria Steinem. 
Together we have drafted a list of 10 demands. We have made them demands, not requests, and we have been forced to resort to the drastic step of taking over this microphone and this forum because of the crisis in which women are placed as a result of pornography. These demands are made in the memory of the 21% of the over 6,000 respondents to a recent Women's Day poll who reported having been sexually abused by men directly influenced by pornography, of the 24% of the raped wives in a random sample survey who were forced by their husbands to act out pornography, and of the 81 missing or dead prostitutes in Green River, Washington, whose lives and deaths were scripted by pornography. Number one. We demand that the Commission acknowledge that the $8 billion a year pornography industry is built on the sexual enslavement and exploitation of women. Number two, we demand that the Commission acknowledge that pornography targets all women for rape, battery, sexual harassment, prostitution, incest, and murder. Number three, we demand that the Commission acknowledge that pornography is a practice of sex discrimination that denies women civil rights and civil liberties. Number four, we demand that the Commission acknowledge that pornography sexualizes and profits from racism, anti-Semitism, and hatred of lesbians and gay men. Number five, we demand that the Commissioners rid themselves of their prejudice against the women who have testified before them about the abuse they have been subjected to because of pornography, we demand that they acknowledge that these women are speaking the truth. Number six, we demand that the Commission devote two full days of hearings to the testimony of all of the women who have wanted to speak out about the ways pornography has injured them, but who have been denied access to this forum. Number seven, we demand that the Commission reject moralistic, ineffective, sexist obscenity laws which create a climate of censorship. Number eight, we demand that the Commission endorse the civil rights anti-pornography laws proposed in Minneapolis, Indianapolis, Los Angeles, and Cambridge, Massachusetts. Number nine, we demand that the Commission recommend federal funding for housing, legal and medical services, education, and job training for women escaping from prostitution and pornography. Number ten, we demand that the Commission recommend that fines levied against pornographers and money and property confiscated from them in criminal proceedings be allocated to programs for their victims. Not true. Listen to Betty for Dan. My name is Trudy Abel Peterson. Have you reduced your, uh, your findings to writing? Fine. Do you have copies for all the commissioners? Fine. Will it be passed? My name is Trudy Abel Peterson, author of the book Children of the Evening. The commission is now going to stand in recess until 1.30. Former victim of and pornography. I am currently... ...and write and listen to and see... And the commission is hell-bent on a course where they're going to make those decisions for the rest of us. You heard a woman known, once known as Linda Lovelace speak today. She called herself a victim. She talked about guns and beatings. And, and, and you don't buy what she's saying, that she was a victim and this should be stopped? No. There Linda Lovelace may or may not that was have a boyfriend that she story. chose that was not somebody in the adult industry who did those things to her. Can you say that again? She chose that man to live with. That was her boyfriend. Those were her bad choices in life. Those were not people in the adult industry who, who made her do anything. So are you in favor not of pornography? People. Yes, I, I'm, I'm in favor of free choice for adults to view sexually oriented material. I'm the editor. I am the editor of a magazine that this commission is investigating and probably trying to shut down. It's called Forum Magazine. I, I have been following this commission for eight months now. I happen to know that it's not serious. It doesn't have a serious budget. It is a, a, a sop by Ronald Reagan to the religious right. After all, Ronald Reagan's son writes for the most popular so-called pornographic magazine in the country. People who have appeared naked in magazines like Penthouse and Playboy are regularly welcomed as guests to the White House. I speak of Sylvester Stallone and also of uh, Joan uh, Joan Collins. So I think this uh, 
We're going to ask you to go to the hall. You can continue in the hall. What are you upset about? I'm upset about censorship in this country, and I'm upset about the government putting out a moral line. It, while the First Amendment is supposed to protect us, uh, the Constitution is supposed to pr protect our right to practice religion, it also protects us from religion or from a government line being perpetrated on people. This is crazy. Pornography, as a matter of fact, in Denmark, since they legalized pornography across the board totally in 1970, child, child rape, child pornography, uh, rapes, and crime against women has gone down 67 percent. The statistics are there. These people parade results that they want everybody to hear, and they're totally one-sided. Their conclusions are foregone. They know what they want to decide before they even have the hearings. It's a kangaroo court. You're saying crime against women has gone down because of pornography? In, in Denmark, yes. Right. As a matter of fact, the results are, and I, you know, I, I, I have in my briefcase, I have some of the articles to support that. But the research says that what it appears is that fantasy can substitute for the real thing, and that you're better off having having people fantasize about things and going out and acting them out on the street. So people who can't, you know, not everybody is beautiful and lovable and wonderful and, and, and maybe they can't find a partner that they can have uh, heterosexual sex with or any other kind. They can't find relationships that they need. So they have to fantasize. And if they can't fantasize, if they can't get material so that they can satisfy themselves and, ha and feel as if they're having some sort of normal sex life, which is a healthy, normal bodily function, regardless of what the moral majority thinks, then they're going to go out in the streets and act out their needs. And your name is? Lindsay Flora, and I'm with the Adult Film Association of America. Thank you. And whom are you with? I'm Leanne Katz. I'm the executive director of the National Coalition Against Censorship. We're extremely concerned at what this commission is and is not doing. They are parading, uh, uh, they are recycling testimony from um, prosecutors, many retired prosecutors who specialize in pornography. They are telling old stories about old prosecutions, and they are neglecting to hear from people who want to express... Yes. Sixteen-year-old girls are used in prostitution, are arrested, and imprisoned with adult criminals. In New York, a woman cannot bring charges against a man for pimping without the corroboration of someone other than a prostitute. As the statistics have documented, these are women with few resources. Most are poor and have been subjected to sexual assault, battery, and rape. Most have pimps. Many are women of color. Many have dependent children. Many were battered wives who were forced into prostitution in order to support their children. Prostitution isn't like anything else. Rather, everything else is like prostitution because it is the model for women's condition. Prostitution is the foundation upon which pornography is built. Pornography cannot exist pro without prostitution. They are interdependent and create a sexual ghetto for women that ensures women's inequality. It is impossible to separate the two. The acts are identical except that in pornography there is a permanent record of the woman's abuse. Likewise, pornographers and their defenders cannot be differentiated from procurers in that procuring is defined as promoting the sexual performance of a woman and a pimp is a pimp is a pimp whether he operates off of 8th Avenue out of penthouses, corporate suites, or the ACLU offices. How do you define pornography? Pornography is the graphic, sexually explicit subordination of women in pictures or in words. I'd like to speak, please. I'm from the Feminist Anti-Censorship Task Force. We think it's a very false claim that getting rid of our First, right, uh, first Amendment uh, rights uh, will help women. We think the Reagan administration could do much better, make much more uh, uh, direct uh, gestures towards women than repressive legislation about ex sexually explicit things. Yeah, well, I mean, we're here to say that pornography silences women. If we want to do anything to ensure that women have civil liberties and civil rights, we're we have to do silence. something about are. this $8 billion a year industry. And we're going to... We wish to speak. 
We wish to speak and we will speak, including in sexually explicit ways. There is something that will be threatened by the law that we support, which is the Dworkin McKinnon legislation. It defines pornography for what it actually is, unlike obscenity laws, which, as you heard speakers in there today, relate to pornography as something obscene, something morally offensive. The feminist approach to pornography sees pornography for the injury Not all that feminists. it actually in inflicts upon women. The Dworkin McKinnon law is captures the best definition there actually is that exists about pornography because what it does is it connects it to the social injury that pornography is and does and it is not contrary to the mandate of the first amendment in this country women and people who say that a do not understand this law and b who who refuse to understand what pornography does to women and children in this country what your name is like my name is norma ramos and i'm an attorney norma what norma ramos and i'm an attorney who supports the dwarka mckinnon law how do you spell your last name r-a-m-o-s and your name please ann snittow s-n-i-t-o-w just go up and start Listen, i'm from lesbians and gays against pornography and i'm really concerned that we're being I was invited five. to bring an actress here. That's the only one they wanted to hear from. And what happened with that request? The actresses all feel that that, that they don't want to give her. Okay. Let me. His name is Lead Holt, L E I D H O L D T, and I'm here as a founding member of Women Against Pornography. All right, I'm sorry. Your name again, please? My name is Dorchin Lead Holt. Dorchin, D O R C H I N D as in dog. Yes. Lee, Lee, last Lead Holt, Lead Holt, L E I D H O L D T. And your group is? Women Against Pornography, but we're here representing 25 feminist organizations from around the country. Thank you. Okay, just tell me your name, please. Uh, Philip Nobile. Spell it? N O B I L E. Fill up with one L. Yes. And you're the editor of Forum Magazine. Yes. Thank you. In the May I interrupt you just enough? To, sure. May I interrupt just to get her name? I'm sorry. Tell me your name. Evelina Kane, Women okay, Against. Sorry. Evelina Kane. I'm staff coordinator. Spell that for me, please. E V E L I N A Kane. K-A-N-E, I'm with Women Against Pornography, and the statement that I made, I issued in conjunct, in solidarity okay, with Whisper and Puma. Thank you. Other, right? um, not, others of us who wanted to testify have not had a mic that was still on, and, and we were outraged at the unfairness of that. Can you tell me your name and spell it for me? Yes. Ann Snittow. Okay. S-N-I-T-O-W. And how, or what is your position? Um, I'm in a group called the Feminist Anti-Censorship Task Force. Okay. We're a grassroots organization that's been responding to the anti-pornography organizing. I'm going to have to turn the light on a second. Okay. So they see you. Okay. <laughs> uh, the Feminist Anti-Censorship Task Force is a grassroots organization uh -huh. that's grown up all over the country in response to the anti-pornography organizing. We think it's a very poor approach to women's okay, we've rights. we've got all that. I just need your name. Do you have a position in that? Uh... There, we're, we're a grassroots organization.